right. Good evening. Good morning, depending upon where you are in this world. My name is Daryl Davis. I'm your host and moderator for the film, All of Us, which I hope all of you have had a chance to view. And I want to welcome our panelists, Ms. Vicki Eastland and Ms. Rory Geller, Mohammed, and also the, the uh, director and creator of the film, All of Us. Uh, he was up uh, pretty late or pretty early, depending upon how you want to look at it. He's in Brussels, Belgium, Mr. Uh, Pierre P uh, Perard. So let me start with, uh, with you, Pierre. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to make this movie and why you made this movie, All of Us, which I have seen a couple of times now, and I just think it's a fantastic movie, and more about that after you finish here. Well, th thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Daryl, for the invitation, and uh, it's great to be tonight or this morning with you. Um, why making this movie and how I came up uh, of meeting also Rory and, and Vicky? Um, as I explained at the beginning of the movie, you know, there was a few facts which came into my life around 2016. The first element is that I was a teacher in an underprivileged school in, in Brussels. And I saw a lot of tension be between the different community, which basically did not talk to each other, uh, had a lot of uh, a priori or préjugé about each other. And I was also present on the bombing attack in, in Brussels in 2016. And that's how I realized how the hate of the others can bring to. Um, at the same time, I was very much involved in, in Senegal, in this small village that you've seen the, the film, Palmarin, where basically you can meet in the village uh, people called Pierre Mustafa or uh, uh, Fatima uh, Marie. Okay? And I say, well, wow. You know, are you Pierre or are you Mustafa? You know, uh, and they start to tell me that in this village they do everything together, and that was the start of you know having the idea of making this film and saying, how can we show positive story of people who have made the step towards the others, uh, doing a, a movie which is uh, what we call a, a feel good movie. Uh, there are so many negative news in the world today that it's good also to show the, all the positive which is happening today. And that's what I hope the movie is bringing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Vicky, uh, I saw you in the movie. So tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and your role and, and why it was important for you to participate in this uh, wonderful film, All of Us. So I am pastoring a very unique church in Brookville on Long Island. And as you saw in the film, we are also a multi-faith campus. And our primary mission is to build bridges of peace between major world religions. So specifically right now, the three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And when Pierre and I first connected and he shared the vision for the film, I felt an immediate kindred spirit. Um, we participated in the film without hesitation because what we're doing in the small corner of the world, um, in our context, Pierre is attempting to spread that message globally. And we wanted to be a part of um, a positive movement toward building those bridges of peace and showing people that um, getting to know those outside of your culture, your background, your religion is not something to be afraid of, but something that can actually enrich your life and make your life personally better and the world um, a more peaceful place to live in. So it was a, it was a no brainer for us to participate in the film. Now, absolutely. But how, how does a man from, from Brussels with a vision find someone in Brookville, Long Island? <laughs> he found us through Rory. Rory oh. and Arif. They were part of our multi-faith campus when they lived in New York. And I think that Pierre found Rory online because she has a wonderful online presence through her ministry and her um, career. Uh, working with interfaith and interracial couples. And she said, Pierre, you really need to reach out to the Brookville Multi-Faith Campus. They're doing amazing things there and you need to hear about it. So that's how we found each other. It was through Rory. All right, and that brings us to Rory, Rory Geller-Mohammed. 
So tell us, Roy, how did you get involved in this work and 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 why? And how did you connect? Uh, how did you know Vicky and Pierre? Yeah, so I got into this work both personally and professionally. Um, and like Reverend Vicky had said, right, I did, I have an online kind of presence around this stuff. Um, I'm Jewish, my husband is Muslim. And so when we have two kids, as you saw from the movie, right, and we're raising them in a multiracial, multicultural, and multi-faith family. And so this work has been something that's really important, that we are creating a world for them that is somewhere, right, that they can thrive, that we can thrive as a family. Um, I do diversity, equity, and inclusion work professionally. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. And so it's always been something that's been part of what I do. Um, I also grew up in a multiracial family. And so some of that has been part of it. Um, and when Pierre reached out, he had read, I think some of my, he read my story because I would write about it because there's not that many, there's not um, that much out there, right? So you don't see, even though there are families, not everybody, you don't always see it everywhere. And so just the fact to, that they're to make space for families like ours. And when he reached out, I was like, wow, that's an awesome, what an awesome idea, what an awesome opportunity. I would love to be able to show that this is what a family looks like that does this, right? <laughs> Fantastic. Well, you know, I've been doing this uh, race reconciliation work for going on about 40 years in between uh, my gigs as a professional musician. And so I'm always fascinated by, by movies on the topic of discrimination, anti-Semitism, racism, et cetera. And this, you know, I'm not just saying this because we're here together, but I'm saying it because it's true. I've seen a lot of movies on the topic, but this is absolutely one of the best. It is something that is global. And I'm fascinated, Pierre, by, by your vision, because most of the movies, you know, that I've seen or documentaries, films that I've seen on this topic tend to be, you know, localized or nationalized, depending upon the country that they're in. Like, for example, in the US, you know, the black and white division, or in Ireland between the Catholics and the Protestants, films about that. You, you just took that whole vision and just took it global. And the, and the beautiful thing about it is it shows that we all have uh, different forms of, of discrimination, you know, within where, you know, we may be, whether it's tribal, whether it's religious, whether it's uh, gender or color or what have you. And, uh, and it allows us to see ourselves in somebody else. And, you know, we know while over here in the United States, you know, we may think, um, it's so ridiculous for people who look alike to discriminate against one another, you know, one another, say in, in Bosnia or something like that, where there's a lot of conflict. And, but the people look alike. And then here we don't look alike. So it gives us another perspective and allows us to do some introspection and say, wow, you know, this is really crazy. Maybe I need to, to, to revise my own thinking. So, you know, that's, that's very visionary, Pierre. How, how did you come up with that global concept? Um, you know, when I started to, to think about this movie, uh, well, I, as I mentioned, you know, the beginning of the movie started in Senegal and in Belgium. So from a start, you know, it started in two different continents, you know, uh, and two different color of, of people also, you know, the black in Senegal and the white in Belgium. Uh, so, so that's where it started. And when I started to look for countries, you know, I started with, and I had a list of 25 countries, you know, and of course you cannot go in 25 countries in some of the country. I did not get the authorization to go and, and film there. I will not name the country. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and once you, I wanted to have countries in the different continent and I wanted to have country which had war like Bosnia, Lebanon, or Indonesia, but a country which were in peace like Senegal, uh, Tatarstan, which is one of the one of the Republic of, of Russia and and the United States, and so once once you identify the country, the step after is to identify the protagonist, and hey, there I had so many choices because you know once you start searching on on Google uh, or in internet, you you find amazing story, you know, like the one of Rory or like the one of uh, Reverend Vicky, uh, but those stories are just two of them, uh, but I find hundreds of them. Uh, so in 2018, I went to those different countries just uh, on scouts, you know, scouting. I think that you, that's what you do, you, you, you say in, in English, uh, just with uh, one cameraman. Uh, we were just the two of us and I came back with 31 stories. 
And from those 31 stories, I had to choose, you know, and select, you know, eight of them, uh, which are the one which is which are in the, the final movie. So, so, but there, there are much more that we can show, much more. And as you mentioned, uh, they will, uh, you know, the, the film is not only about the, the the difference that we have between the 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 fate that we may have. The difference is it's about the other and. Who, who are the other for us? You know, the other is the one that we are afraid of. You know, it could be a different color of skin, could be a different gender, could be a different language. You know, that in Belgium we have a lot of, of you know, tension between the, the Dutch speaker and the Flemish speaker, the, the French speaker. You know, uh, so so the others are the ones that you are afraid of. And what I wanted to have is basically showing that uh, people everywhere in the world every day are wake up and say, I want to make a difference and I want to make the step toward the others. Uh, it could be very difficult in some situation like in Bosnia or Lebanon, or it could be more easy. Uh, but the people that I've met, you know, are taking a, um, a voluntary step uh, to bridge. Uh, and like uh, Reverend Vicky was mentioning, um, fear is, is, is coming from ignorance. Uh, why once you you start knowing the other, you know, fear are uh, immediately disappearing. Indeed, you know, I I had the great pleasure of uh, of living in uh, Senegal in Dakar uh, for two years, so I'm I'm well, I'm well aware of the beauty there, and uh, I think it's wonderful that you included that country is one of my favorite countries. Uh, I have five favorite countries in the world, and that's def definitely one of them. So uh, let me start with you, uh, Vicky. Uh, what what are some of the things, some of the the similarities that you try to stress between, you mentioned the three faiths of uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam that, uh, that we all can learn from, you know, that we don't generally see unless we talk to some people of, uh, of those various faiths that, are, that are, are the others, you know, from ours, from our own. All right, thank you, Daryl. Uh, on our campus, we focus on those similarities and not on our differences um, as much because we feel that it's important to realize that there is a lot of crossover between the Abrahamic faiths. You know, all of us in those three religions uh, trace our lineage back to Abraham. And there is a lot of parallel that most people don't know if they don't study the other two religions such as people who are not Muslim do not realize that there are a lot of similar stories in the Quran as there are in the Bible. Uh, Jesus is revered as, um, as a very important person in the Quran. So is Mary, um, Jesus's mother. And a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, the, the other thing with Judaism is that we are basically, it's an understanding that we're just a continuation in Christianity of the story that is a shared story between Jews and Christians. Um, I wish I could remember, we had we had an Identities and Transitions commencement. That's kind of a rite of passage for our interfaith community, which is made up of Jewish and Christian families. And they're raising their children with a love and respect and an education and a participation in worship in both of those faith traditions. And at the commencement just a few weeks ago, one of the students said it so beautifully when he talked about how he didn't, he didn't feel a separation between his Christian identity and his Jewish identity, that he just felt that the New Testament was a continuation of the Old Testament story. And I loved how he said that. It was, um, it was such a, a beautiful way of describing it. Uh, that's, that's all that I can come up with at the moment. Okay, and so once, once we get uh, Jews and, and, uh, and Muslims and Christians on the same page, then we gotta bring in the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Sikhs right. and everyone else, right? right. Um, you know, it, it, you, it, what you said, you know, reinforces what I've always said, that a missed opportunity for dialogue is a missed opportunity for conflict resolution. And, and you're proving it right there by having this interfaith 
thing. Was, uh, was there anything that you learned during the filming of All of Us that you didn't know before that gave you pause for thought? You're asking me. I am. Um, Pierre and his film crew came. I, were you with us? It wasn't a whole week, was it? It was. Yeah, it was. It was an whole week. week. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And and in that week, there was a busy schedule of interviewing the various faith leaders. Um, there was a lot of material that. Pierre walked away with and had a challenge in narrowing down which story to an angle to kind of take because there is so much happening on our campus that is great and positive. It was really more about us sharing our story and living that story as he filmed than it was of us interacting or even hearing um, in real time the stories. I mean, Pierre had shared a little bit with me on the side about some of the other stories that he had been um, filming in the other countries. But there really wasn't an opportunity for us to have an on-camera dialogue. Um, we did do, which you saw lots of clips from a joint worship service that we do every year around Thanksgiving, um, right. our multi-faith Thanksgiving service. But we recreated that in September um, for Pierre. And that really gives you a flavor of what our camaraderie and our shared vision is um, on our campus, that we can worship side by side and have no conflicts with that. Um, but as far as learning new things, it was really more about us presenting our story. Okay. Now, Rory, you, know, you, you mentioned that you were involved, and of course we saw in the movie, uh, an interfaith marriage. Mm -hmm. um, growing up, was was that something you know that that it was open to you, or was it something that you discovered later on because you had traveled? Uh, you know, were, were you were you growing up thinking um, I'm going to grow up and, and marry a nice Jewish boy, or or were you open to anybody and everybody at the time? Yeah, so I would say I was much, I was very open where my husband, if he was here right now, he would tell you he wasn't. He was think, he was growing up thinking he's going to marry a Muslim woman. He didn't have the idea, he had no idea that it was going to be someone else out of that. So you that had that space. magic power over him. Right. <laughs> um, for me, I, so for me, my, it was a little bit different because um, growing up, um, I, I have a sibling that's adopted and so he's actually he's Catholic and so there was some interfaith it wasn't when I was younger but there is some interfaith stuff that happened throughout my life although it was mainly my I was very much raised Jewish so for me it wasn't as much of kind of what that was but I didn't actually think through what that meant right like the idea of like would I marry somebody Jewish it was kind of like whoever it is that I feel connected to but when I met my husband, I met her, right? And we were dating. I think at that point, there was a lot more things that we had to think about that I don't think I thought of ahead of time. <laughs> was was there ever a point where there was talk about you, you're converting to Islam or him converting to Judaism in order to yeah. marry in a synagogue or in a mosque or whatever? Yes, there was. So he was, it was more on his side where he was like, well, like, what would I think about converting to Islam? And for me, it was a point where I was a little bit more also disconnected to my religion, but I feel like it's very much part of my culture and my heritage. Um, and I feel like I've also through our process have become reconnected to it spirituality wise. Um, but at that time I was like, well, what would it mean for me to convert? Like what I had to like think about it. Like, and I, I, I didn't say straight out, no. I was like, let me think about it. And I was like, I don't even know enough about the religion. Like, how can I make a decision? I don't know that much about it. So I kind of went on this sort of self-learning journey where I like visited mosques and I like went to kind of see what prayers were like and try to do my own sort of self-study in different spaces. Like I was in New York. And so I went to different places trying to learn and have conversations with people. Um, and I kind of came to this place where like, I, it, it's, it's amazing and it's a beautiful religion, but I, for me, it wasn't something where I didn't want to have to give up one to take on something else. And so I was very much that I wanted to, that we could be both and that our family, that our family could embrace both religions. Excellent. And, and Pierre, um, when you, when you came to, to meet uh, Rory, was that something that 
you know, that fascinated you, this, uh, this interaction between two, two, uh, two, two, well, there's a lot of similarity between both, both religions, but we perceive them as being, you know, a dichotomy apart. Yeah, honestly, I mean, for me, it's, there's a lot of time when people ask me, what is the story which really, uh, you know, uh, surprised me the most, okay? And probably being um, and living with Rory and Ari for, for a few days, and um, there, there was also a tornado when we were filming in Florida. <laughs> and, and so basically- It was, it was, it was hurricane, we were waiting for a hurricane. <laughs> yeah. what, else, so, what else is new in Florida? <laughs> right, and, and so basically we were stuck with the family for a few days, you know, <laughs> and we are actually really living with them and, and see how not only Rory and Arif and their two child were living, but the whole family were living together. You know, we, we met the parents of Rory, we met the father of Arif, we met the, I don't know, the godfather, the uncle, the, everybody was there, okay? And, uh, and for me, one thing which was so surprising, it's when we had Shabbat on, on Friday and I saw Arif with the kippah on his head, you know? And for me, it's a, wow, that's a Muslim wearing a kippah, you know? <laughs> and for me, that was such a big surprise, you know? Um, and, and the day after, um, the, the family of Arif came and they pray uh, in, in the living room. Uh, and, and there was the, the family of, of Rory just watching them praying. And after there was, I think it was your grandfather, uh, Rory, asking all kinds of questions. You know, why do you put your hand like that? And why do you shake your hand like that? And those you know, basic dialogue just opened the door so, to everything, you know, and uh, so, so yes, for me, it was a, a big uh, positive surprise to see how the family was working together. And I must say, because I've been presenting the film in, I don't know how many countries now, and I was in Morocco like 10 days ago, I was in Rabat uh, showing the film, and, and the story of Rory and Arif are always in Muslim country, the one which is shocking the most, because they say, it cannot happen, you know, it's, it's not possible, okay? Uh, and I say, well, yeah, well, you know, they are, you know, Muslim and they are Jewish and this is happening, you know? And, and, and this is fascinating. And also the, the story of, of Reverend Dickey, um, people are always curious if they try to mix the religion by doing something new. It's like, you know, having a shakers and they shake together and boom, there is something new pop up. And Reverend Vicky has been very clear, like uh, uh, um, uh, Rabbi Stewart and uh, Dr. Sultan, that they are all uh, included in their faith and they don't try to, to create something new, you know? Uh, and so I, I take always a lot of time to explain that because the people believe that there is something new coming. No, no, it's just that they try to, to look for the similarity and not uh, focusing on the difference. So th those two stories in, in Muslim country are the one which are probably trigger the most attention and question. Uh, and I have to spend a lot of time to explain that story. <laughs> you know, and it's so great, you know, that you captured that on film for everybody to see, because it's inspiring to all of us you know, to, to see that because, you know, we have preconceived notions about, mm -hmm. you know, these two people should not be together or what have you. And they absolutely defy what we perceive, just shatter, shatter the myth, you know? And, you know, one, one of the beautiful things that, um, that I thought in the movie also, I forgot the gentleman's name, but he was talking about the, uh, the sporting event, I guess it was, that the girl was organizing. And he said that he used to be afraid of, of people with long beards. Uh, and, yes, and I thought, wow wow, you know, that is a transformation because there's so many people that espouse those, those kinds of views, either against people with long beards or against skin color or what have you. And just his interacting with, with someone in a positive manner, taking the time to get to know one another is something that we all should, should do. You know, we spend way too much time, I know in this country, and I'm sure in other countries as well, we spend way too much time talking about the other person or talking at the other person, talking past the other person. Things can really change when we spend just a little bit of time 
talking with the other person. Um, what what were some things that uh, that perhaps you saw, Pierre? That uh, I, I know you captured, you know, a million stories. Of course, you don't have a million hours to put it into a film. But what were some of the things that uh, that did not make the film? That if you were to do a part two, that we might see that you still have in the can in your closet somewhere. Well, you know, um, it's the story in Tatarstan. So again, Tatarstan is one of the 26 republic of, of Russia. 50% mm -hmm. um, of the population are Orthodox, uh, so Christian. 50% are Muslims. Uh, and so we, we spend time there with a family, a pretty poor family in the neighborhood of Kazan, which is the capital of, of Tatarstan. And that family adopted 13 children, uh, both Muslim and Christian. And so we spent a lot of time with them, seeing how they were living together, you know, those, those two parents with the 13, ch 13 children, you know. Um, and so um, the story was beautiful, uh, beautiful image, great people, uh, fantastic story. But when we were at the editing stage, at one point of time, you, make to, you have to make a rough decision, you know, and the story was not adding something new to the, to the other story. So that's why... Uh, I had to make the decision to, to leave that story out of the final version that uh, you, you have seen. But maybe one day we'll make a 26 minutes just focusing on, on that specific story of Tatarstan, you know. Okay. And uh, Rory, is there anything that, uh, that you wish you could have added into the movie that um, as an afterthought said, oh, I wish, you know, we, I, I thought about this at the time? Um, I don't know if there's anything as an afterthought. Um, I think it's interesting because right, like it's, it's, when we filmed it, it was like two and a half, right, years ago. It was before, right, three years ago. And so it's interesting just from then to now, right? Like kids are getting older. We're having different conversations. We're navigating things differently. So I feel like it, it's interesting just the shift and the change of how how it goes along. So nothing. And and for and for all of you, um, you know, it's such a positive movie with positive outcomes. But even so, there are people out there who, who still need to see this movie and, and take away some of these concepts. Um, have, you, have any of you uh, received any, um, any negative uh, reactions to your participation in the movie or, for, or for, uh, for trying to bring people together, things like that? I know like as, as someone who sits down and, uh, and has conversations with uh, white supremacists, and they end up, you know, changing their views. Uh, I get a lot of support, but I also have my share of detractors who who don't like what I'm doing. So, have you experienced any any of that kind of thing? Any anybody? Let's start with you, uh, Vicky. I am really surprised that we haven't. There's been at times a a fear from people on our campus that we are setting ourselves up as a target for persecution and um, possibly even worse, violence. And there's only two um, very minor, I think, incidents that I can think of in the 10 years that I have been there and we've been doing this work. One was someone who showed up um, on the property on a day that I was just there in the office by myself. And he was very, very, very upset when he saw the sign um, in the front of our property that has all of our faith communities listed on it. And he said, how can you, how can you do this? Um, how can you defame the church by letting all of these uh, other groups I'm saying it very nicely, <laughs> uh, be a part of your campus. And I, I felt, I did feel threatened, but it was, it wasn't, it ended up not being that serious of a situation. Um, but we haven't received hate mail. We haven't had people protesting. The other incident, we don't know who did it. It could have, it could have been a, a discriminatory thing. It could have not, but we have a pride flag that, was flying um, next to our sign because we are a inclusive 
campus to the LBGTQIA plus community and someone in the middle of the night had broken the pole on the flag and jabbed it through the flag to put a hole in the middle of it. And like I said, it could have been uh, vandalism by a kid and it didn't have any motivation, um, but I, I have a feeling that's not the case. But those are the only two um, incidents that we've had, which has been really surprising to me. Um, well, so we're so we are moving in the right direction. Maybe and, so. And and let's let's hope that you continue to be surprised in a positive way. Yes, like thank that. You. How about Rory? How about you? You know, you you've gained Sorry. worldwide recognition <laughs> for your interfaith marriage. Yeah. Uh, has there, has everything been been smooth sailing for you in regards um, to yeah. your exposure? Yeah, so, so far, yes. There's been concern, like I've kind of had like a worry, like would anything come from it? Um, and I tend to kind of be outspoken in general. Like I was like, you know, put my blogs out there, I have a podcast. So I talk about these topics anyway. Um, so I've been very fortunate, grateful so far. Sorry, mommy duties right here. It's okay. There's the other one who should get a little appearance. <laughs> oh, hello there, hello there. Okay, I'm gonna take you one minute. Um, and so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. You know, you, you, you mentioned that um, in the beginning when you, you know, were first uh, dating uh, your, your, you know, then boyfriend, uh, it was he who was more hesitant or resistant. What was the point where he made that turnaround? And why did he make that turnaround? Yeah, so a big piece of that when we talked about like, you know, why, why was it so hard? For, like, why was it so hard for him to imagine what this could look like? Where for me, right, I feel like I had seen sort of maybe what this could, could look like. Um, and part of it was like, there weren't really other models out there of what it could look like. Are you still on mute? Sorry. You're, 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 there you go. Yeah. Um, and so he, he actually had a friend who had been raised in two religions and they ended up being a completely other one. And so part of the fear came from that. And so actually connecting with Brookville multi-faith campus was a big turning point for us where he could imagine what that looked like. Um, seeing other couples, seeing like, oh, this happens in, in, in this space. He even just talked about the other day, we were um, another couple that um, as a family member on his side that is marrying someone of, a, of another faith. And we we're kind of talking about what that, Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, that's okay. So, Vicky, let me ask you: uh, when when you see this uh, this discrimination within, you know, religions who who seem to be xenophobic against other other faiths, even though they believe in the same God, or they just happen to worship differently, do you think that how, how much of it do you think? really comes from within them, the, the people themselves uh, promulgating this discrimination? Or how, or how much of it do you think comes from uh, their fear of how they're gonna be viewed for associating with someone else, but you know, viewed by their family members, by their, by their peers at work, by you know, um, their friends? Are they gonna be ostracized? Things like that, like, you know, for example, um, if if I'm Catholic and I decide to to date a a Jewish boy, um, you know how how many of my Catholic uh, you know friends and relatives are going to ostracize me, and therefore I'm not going to do it, even though I I really like this guy, or this girl, or whatever. So the people that come to us on our campus are are searching out a place of support, and I don't have a lot of interaction with people that are. Um, you know what, I'm going to take a different direction with this question. One of the biggest things that we do on our campus is provide a dual faith home for Jewish Christian families. And there have been so many of those families that couples that have come to us broken and hurt because the churches and synagogues that they grew up in when they um, fell in love with someone of another faith were rejected by their um, their home church or their home synagogue and were told by their pastor, their priest, their rabbi 
that they could not and would not um, marry them, would not officiate their weddings. Or they would say, you can come as a couple and worship here with us, but we're only going to recognize one half of your family, whether it's mm -hmm. in the synagogue, the, um, the person that's Jewish, in a church, the person that is Christian. The other thing that, oh, so let me, let me say that with that, they have found a place where their church and their synagogue shares the same worship space. So it becomes a church on Sunday mornings and a synagogue on Friday nights, and those families can worship as, as whole units and be welcomed into that space um, and those worship experiences as uh, completely embraced, whether it's one religion or the other. The other thing that we have seen quite a bit is the grandparents, you know, the, the couple's parents that have had the hardest time with the relationship. I remember one family who had a really, really difficult time. The mother was Jewish and she came up to me and said that she was having so much conflict with her family that they basically said that if she did not leave the marriage, that she would be um, written out of the will. So I've had lots of grandparents that have come into our setting for various reasons, whether it's a bar or bat mitzvah, um, confirmation, baptism, um, baby naming ceremony, and have come up to me even as recently as a week ago and have said thank you for providing this place where um, my, my um, daughter or my son and their spouse have a place to belong, have a faith home, and that that has actually opened our eyes to seeing that this is an okay thing and that they're staying connected to their original faith um, and finding a place where, where they can do that together. So the biggest conflict that I've seen is really in the, um, the parents of the couple. Yeah. But it's been beautiful to see how a lot of them have changed their opinion by watching the couple worship um, and live out their own faith journeys together. And again, this is why, you know, this movie, All of Us, is so important to, to anybody and everybody around the world, not just here in our own country. It, it definitely gives us a window into other forms of discrimination that perhaps, you know, we don't always see here in the U.S., but, and it will give us pause for thought. But I think it's such a wonderful, inspirational, and therapeutic movie for all of us. To, all, that's the name of the movie, no pun intended, but for all of us to, to see, because it, it does reflect all of us, you know? Um, speaking of which, <clears throat> I give anywhere between 60 and 80 lectures a year, a lot of them to corporations or college campuses, things like that. And I can tell you, you know, two, two to three out of every 10 lectures that I give, this will happen. Um, I'll, I'll do the lecture, I'll do the Q&A, and then at the end, there'll still be some students or some people who come down to the podium to ask one last question or maybe look at one of the KKK robes I bring or something. And uh, there'll be somebody, two or three out of 10 times, there'll be somebody standing in the back doing absolutely nothing, just wandering around. And I know what's gonna happen. They're waiting for the crowd to go away from the podium. And when the crowd dissipates, they'll come down and approach me and they, you know, they'll look around, make sure nobody else is around. And they'll say, oh, you know, I, I enjoyed your lecture. Um, my mother is in, is in the KKK, or my father is a neo-Nazi, and that's how I was raised, you know, back home, and now I'm here at University of whatever, and uh, my boyfriend is Jewish, or my girlfriend is Black, you know, and I can't bring my friend home, my parents will kill me, my parents will disown me, and I don't want to tell my friend because they'll, they'll drop me, you know, so they have this secret that's burning on their chest, and they need to get it out, tell somebody, and they feel that I'm the perfect person for them to tell because you know they were raised that way, and you know they they're in a neighborhood, uh, an area where everybody votes for the same person, they cheer the same sports team, they go to the same school, etc. 
But now when they go away to college, you know, the high school, the neighborhood does not come with them. On the college campus, there are neighborhoods and high schools from all over the country, maybe even all over the world. And they're seeing things that they don't see at home. They're learning that Jewish people don't have horns or black people don't have tails and all these other crazy things. But how, how do they go home and tell their parents that they were wrong? How do they tell their friends they were wrong? You know, because their parents wanted them to go and get an education, but not that education, you know? But as we progress and go through generation to generation, you know, it gets a little better each time. You know, there may be a problem with the parents, maybe a bigger problem with the grandparents, you know, something like that, but it tends to get a little better. Uh, so I, I wanna move on to some of the questions here. And Pierre, let's start with you. Um, this person asked, can you summarize some points in the movie about how to help disparate people from groups that might otherwise despise each other and get along peacefully uh, to promote friendship? Uh, can you rephrase the question for me? Sure. Uh, the person wants to know if you can summarize some of the points in the movie about how to get people to come to, co to come together who at one time despised each other, who did not like each other, and how to get them to come come together and promote uh, peace, uh, peace and friendship. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, I think the story, the two story that we have from Bosnia illustrate quite well your your question. Uh, basically. Um, uh, in, the, in the story of, of Bosnia, there are two, two protagonists. One, one story focuses on the resilience part. Resilient, is it an it English word? Resilient? Uh, yes. Yeah, resilience. Yes, right. Uh, that's the, the story of Nujema. And the second part uh, is the story of, uh, of Kemal, talk about forgiveness. Uh, and, and I think those two elements are very important on how can we bring uh, two people uh, together uh, which were uh, tear apart by, by war. And I think the importance of forgiveness is, is so important. The importance of resi resilience also is very important. But forgiveness, is, it's a long process. You know, in the story of Kemal, it took 15 years or 16 years to him, for him to, to forgive finally to the people who have uh, tortured him at the time of the war in Bosnia. So those two elements are probably part of the answer I can give uh, right now. Great. And uh, thank you very much, Pierre. Uh, Vicky, this is for you. Dave wants to know, how can each of the three Abrahamic faiths help support the others? Each community is remarkably diverse in its own right, yet there seem to be a minority of extremists that tend to play into the stereotypes. Yes, unfortunately, that is the case because extremism in any religion tends to get the most attention. And that story or narrative is, is blown up larger than the positive stories of how people are getting along and um, coming together. That's why I think it, Pierre's film is so important. One of the things that all three of us as the faith leaders on our campus feel equally called to, and I think part of what brought us together is this idea that all three of us are called to bring reform to our respective faith traditions. Um, there is an extremist element in that, in the sense that we are breaking away from the norms of um, how Christianity, Judaism, and Islam is traditionally practiced to be more inclusive and to um, to be, for lack of better way of describing it, more contemporary, more modern, more with the times as far as how the world is progressing. But to juxtaposition that um, with the extremist in those faiths that are violent, that are saying that their way is the right way to a point of, of um, even wanting to annihilate those who are outside of that faith tradition. I think the only way to come up against that is to model a different way of doing things. Okay. Right? And then that's yeah. one of the things that Rory was saying that, um, 
people have to see and have role models to realize that it's actually possible. And her story that she is living out in her family is such a, a positive role model for other individuals who think that it's not even possible, it's not even an option, it's not even um, something that they would think of to marry someone, to fall in love with someone of another faith, especially a faith that maybe seems to be in conflict with, with the other. Um, so coming into the world with that positive story and narrative is a really good way to counter the violent and negative extremism in, in any religion, is to be the, the right role model, not the, not the wrong one. Well, you know, you said, uh, you know, you, you, you were breaking away from the norms. Um, I, I would say, I, I would phrase it to say that you're breaking away from the status quo and creating what should be a norm. I love that. I love that. Can I quote you, Daryl? That's perfect. That's so okay. Uh, Rory, uh, someone asked, I'm going to throw this one to you. Uh, my children were raised, exposed to both Judaism and Christianity, as well as other world religions, but we celebrated those two religions for major holidays. We tried with another family to take children to a mosque in Denver to expose them to Islam, but they refused. Since exposure is so key to overcoming fears, differences, how can we do this if these mosques are so close to outsiders, especially women? I would love to attend a service, but we just couldn't make it happen. Yeah, so I'm glad that's a, a great question. It's awesome that this person wants to like learn more and find out more. Um, the way that I kind of started kind of engaging was sort of through interfaith events. And so sometimes like if you connect with an interfaith event, sometimes there are institutions already having the opportunity or working if you are part of whether the Jewish or Christian institution that you maybe are connected with, asking them to partner with um, a mosque to maybe do something. You have to, there's I think an aspect of trust possibly that can come up as well, right? For the safety of the community, for, for the people that are attending the mosque. And so, I mean, I'm not sure kind of what, the, I would say don't give up as far as like your learning on that journey. Um, the piece about, um, I think there's a generalization, right, about this piece about women that's often a stereotype um, in, in Islam, right? So to just kind of be cautious about that. Um, so when we say close to outsiders, right, I think in many ways, any institution can be very close to outsiders. Um, I think there's sort of cultural things that sort of many um, Islamic communities, right, are also... And, and mosques are, um, the, um, well, that's everything. So I, I, this, yeah, so I did connecting through like interfaith events, I think finding if that one, you feel, and even reaching out, right? If you reach out to the imam that's there and just kind of say, how can I learn? Maybe attending one of their services is not, their prayer service is not the way that they want to do it. Maybe they have another way to learn. Um, and I would say connecting with other people, connect with people that are Muslim in your community. Right, and people. Right, how do we do that? So making even those friendships, maybe they'll go with them. Right, when they're going, they'll just take you. Um, and so yes, I mean, I've gone. Like I, we go as a family, right? And so yes, women and men, right, are often separated. But it's not women typically are the ones that I've been to. There are almost always women there. Sometimes there are more men, but we, the women in, in my my husband's family, they do attend. And we should also remember that you know one mosque or one church or one synagogue or one temple does not speak for the entire religion that's why we have so many denominations of of even the same religion you know because one may not agree with another one might be orthodox one might be reformed one might be conservative etc cetera, etc cetera. and there are different levels as to what they allow what they don't allow even within the same denomination so I, I would also say to, to the person asking the question um, or wanting to go explore a mosque, don't let that one refusal be the end all. You know, try some other mosques. You know, there may be some who are more acquiescent, just like I'm sure, Vicki, you, you have experienced perhaps earlier in your life um, a, uh, a pushback on, 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 on a female clergy, right? Because in, yeah, yeah, I see you nodding your head real big. 
Right. You know, because, you know, in, in the, in, in our Bible, in the Christian Bible, I, I, I think it's in first Corinthians somewhere where it says something to the effect, a woman shall not speak in the church. And some people take that literally. So therefore, if you can't speak in the church, you know, you cannot be in the pulpit, you know, talking. Uh, so, you know, you don't give up, you keep pressing ahead until you find that, you know, that one that will, you know, in, invite you to it. So, P so Pierre, what's, what, what is next in the works for you? Is there going to be a part two? How has this movie impacted you? Um, you know, you, you've done a, a fantastic job in educating and inspiring, you know, all of us by, by this fantastic film that touches on, you know, as you point out, you know, 25 different countries or something and lots of different pockets of, uh, of us versus them so that we all can see it's not just one form of discrimination going on, but the tools that we use to combat discrimination are all very similar. It's all based upon us getting to know them so that us and them become we. Yeah, so uh, well, the, the, the next step, no, there will not be a part two, but uh, what, I, what I'm hoping is that the film will be um, uh, broadly view, especially in a high school, because for me, that's the, the key focus is the younger generation. That's where we can still act. That's why the, this film goes together with a pedagogical file that every teacher can get on. Uh, they go on the website of the film, they can uh, you know, download the pedagogical file and watch the film in their classroom uh, and talk with the high school kids uh, about the film, about the subject of discrimination. Uh, and for example, the film has been recognized by the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Education in Belgium. So it has been seen in a lot of school here in Belgium. And I hope that that will happen again in, in some other countries. We, in, we are in discussion now with Canada to have it also as an official movie to be seen in school. Uh, so that, that's my hope for the future for, for that film for, in terms of uh, diffusion broadcasting. Yeah. And for people who, who have not seen the film, but have heard about it, are fascinated, have an interest in it, where, where can they go to, to view the film? Well, right now it's still on YouTube. Uh, so you just go on YouTube and you type Nutus or all of us and you will find it. It's available in 13 different languages. So you, know, you, you will find a language which will suit you. Uh, and uh, it will be on YouTube until uh, June 22. We are looking now what we will do after June, June 22, but most probably we'll stay on, on, on YouTube also because uh, the, the whole idea that we have is to get as many people as we can to, to see the, the, the film. So most probably we'll leave it on, on YouTube and yeah, have the film having its own life on, on, on the net. Yeah. So you can find it on YouTube uh, under all of us. Uh, or A2, which is French for all of us, yes? Nutus, 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 uh, all of us. But if you, if you type all of us the film, you, you will find it. All of us the film, and you can pick one, one of 13 languages. Exactly, one, yes. Which is so great. And, you know, the, how, how has travel, Pierre, because you've done a lot of traveling, uh, with the, not only with this movie, but even in... Before in making the movie, you ended up in Senegal and, and different places. You just flew in from Spain. How how important to you uh, is travel to 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 see to uh, to having this this world view, this global view, this lack of us versus them? Well, you know, I'm lucky to to come from a very very small country compared to the U.S. So, you know, if I make it, you know, 50 miles north, 50 miles east, 50 miles south. I'm in some other country, so so that's why I'm very lucky to be to be in Belgium because that's so easy to travel and to see something different. Uh, so yes, I will you know encourage uh, everybody to to go outside you know and and see other others are, are living you know and that, that will open your eyes you know and uh, and it's it's so fascinating to to see other culture uh, and also uh, see also all how close we are in terms of, of, of reaction, you know? Yeah. Uh, so as Amin Malouf say in the movie, we are all human being at the end, you know? So we have all the basic, all the same basic values. Indeed, you know, and I want to, uh, I want to, I want to share a quote with everyone 
uh, it's one of my favorite quotes. It's by the American author Mark Twain, whose real name was Samuel Clemens. And it's called the travel quote. And I think, you know, uh, Pierre exemplifies what Mark Twain talks about. Uh, he said, Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. And that is so true. You know, all we have to do is travel either physically or, or through cyberspace on the internet, connect with people, walk across the cafeteria. You know, we all may work together in the same office building, go to church, go to church, go to school in the same, in the same place. But yet when we go out to lunch, we sit with our own. You know, we self-segregate. Just once or twice a week, walk across the cafeteria and sit at somebody else's table. You know, you, you will get to know something about them. They will get to know something about you and you will make a new friend. And that's where it starts. And Pierre, I wanna thank you very much, man, for, for sharing this movie with everybody. And folks, let me tell you something. Pierre spent a lot of time, a lot of money on this movie, but Pierre has made his movie available to everyone in the world for free. You do not have to pay to see this movie. It should be in every theater, it should be in every school, and it's free. And there is so much we all can learn about it because this man has shared his vision. And you see people from all over the world. And when you see the movie, you're gonna see yourself in it. You're gonna think, oh, you know what? Hmm, that gives me a, a new perspective. Maybe I should view things this way or that way. So it's very inspirational, Pierre. And I wanna thank you very much for for, uh, for your movie, All of Us, New Too, uh, that, that is available on YouTube for everybody to see for free. I also want to thank you, especially because you're six hours ahead of me. So it's three o'clock in the morning, your time. I'm going to send you to bed now. And I want to thank, I want to thank our other panelists, uh, Vicki Eastland from the movie and uh, Rory Geller Muhammad also from the movie. Thank you all very much. And you out there, the audience, thank you so much for your questions. Really, really appreciate them. And I hope that uh, it's inspiring, you know, and you will share all this information with your friends and watch the movie again, now that you've seen the people who are in it and have been able to, to hear their voices uh, answer your questions. So I bid you all have a wonderful evening, a wonderful morning, afternoon, wherever you may be. Thank you all very much. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.